pleasure to bring you guys the Sustainability Speaker Series. Um, it's also hosted by the Westmont Garden and Sustainability Club uh, and the Gady Institute. So thanks for uh, being here. And um, today we have Dr. Paul Willis, who is from our very own um, English department. So this is the first time we've had a Westmont professor share in this Sustainability Speaker Series. Um, so we're super glad to welcome Dr. Willis. Um, he was born in Southern California uh, and grew up in Oregon, and now he's been at Westmont uh, in, for 30 years. Um, so yeah, please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, so pleased to see you here. I thought the week of Thanksgiving we'd be sitting in a circle where two or three are gathered together. So it's very nice that you're here. And I'm kind of amazed I was invited to speak for the sustainability series because I've been told most of my ideas are unsustainable. <laughs> uh, I, when Kenny asked me to speak, I thought, well, I'm more of a writer. I write poems and essays and a few stories. I'll, I'll probably figure out a way to do a reading and make a few half coherent introductory remarks. But I got going on the introductory remarks, and they sort of took over the presentation. So maybe a little bit of reading at the end. But my title is The Sabbath of the Wild, Tending and Releasing the Garden. Uh, our campus is 111 acres. Uh, it is largely undeveloped. I don't know what the exact percentage is. Do you know, Randy? No. No? Okay. We say 8% is not paved or anything. Okay. So. That's quite a bit. More than you'd think. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, kind of wild, especially the riparian areas where over the years I've constructed a couple of miles of trail along Chelum Creek and Westmont Creek. Uh, so a little bit of wilderness on our campus, uh, interrupted by a beautiful garden and some chickens and uh, some beehives. A um, week and a half ago, I had one of those dreams where I woke up in a cold sweat before dawn. And this was the dream. I was coming down the trail from Mountain Drive and somebody had widened it and covered it with asphalt, thick asphalt. And then before I got down to the baseball field, I came onto a huge parking lot with a new conference center and a uh, fast food, big fast food restaurant. <laughs> and uh, I woke feeling shaken. This was a nightmare. I had a sense of violation. But then, then I wonder, where does this feeling come from? And what's so good about the wild? Okay. And I want to try to answer this question both experientially and biblically. Uh, first, uh, the experience of the wild. And Kenny asked me to speak a little bit biographically, so I'll do so. As Kenny told you, I was born in Southern California but grew up in Oregon in the Willamette Valley, uh, right at the foot of the Coast Range, where our house was on the edge of the town of Corvallis. We looked out across the pasture to a beautiful ridge forested with Douglas fir that was in the State University forest, McDonald Forest. And I just felt this natural attraction to McDonald Forest behind our house. I would, from a young age, I would hike out for uh, maybe a full day and I got a little older and I'd stay overnight and just curious uh, what was there and wanting to dwell there. You know, once, once in a while you'd find an old growth Douglas fir that you couldn't begin to put your arms around. Uh, and I just felt there was something basically good about the place. On the other side of our house we could look across the Willamette Valley to the Cascade Range uh, in the winter, the snowy volcanoes would be quite evident. And um, from early in high school on, my brother and I got busy climbing some of these peaks. I remember climbing the South Sister, uh, I think age 14, my first summit. And, and the peaks in Oregon are kind of all lined up. 
And from there, you could look north and see the Middle Sister and the North Sister and Mount Washington and Three Finger Jack and Mount Jefferson and Mount Hood and then kind of barely in the distance, maybe Mount Adams, maybe Mount St. Helens in the state of Washington. And I remember my brother looked at me, we were both so exhilarated to be up on this peak and he said, let's climb the rest of those by the end of the summer. Mm. And uh, we had no idea what we were doing. You know, we went out with a, a, a light heart and a clothesline, as they say. Um, well, actually, literally, we bought a 75-foot polypropylene water ski rope. And we thought it was too long, so we cut it in half and uh, didn't use it in any of the approved ways. But um, we, we were just uh, enamored, and I had this feeling as a high school student of, of being in a very good place, uh, being, being bathed in a kind of goodness. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I got to go on a National Science Foundation program for the summer uh, on the Juneau Ice Field on the Boundary Range, right at the corner of Southeast Alaska and British Columbia and the Yukon, a huge glaciated area. It's been uh, occupied by scientists every summer since World War II. And uh, that, that too gave me such an expansive feeling. A um, couple years later, um, two year, uh, let's see, a month long uh, expedition on Denali or Mount McKinley. And um, you know, my favorite poet in high school was Robert Service, that, that versifier of the Klondike. And, and he has this poem, The Spell of the Yukon. Uh, the freshness, the freedom, the farness. Oh God, how I'm stuck on it all. And that expressed it for me. When I got to college at Wheaton, I could not figure out why none of my English major friends liked Robert Service at all. Um, I remember being in a class and we were studying The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot. I couldn't make head nor tail of The Wasteland. And <laughs> the professor asked me, what is this poem essentially about? And I pointed to the only line I understood in the poem, which is, in the mountains, there you feel free. So, uh, meanwhile, my older brother had come to uh, Westmont. He'd taken over an a outdoor wilderness program called Sierra Tracks, which was run through Mount Hermon at the time. I joined him in that. Uh, we ran outward bound style trips in the uh, Sierra Nevada and the Trinity Alps and the Cascades and the Wallawa Mountains and the North Cascades and Washington State. Uh, and uh, included for Westmont winter tracks back when uh, um, Westmont had a Jan term and uh, it included for 41 years the 12 day inoculum program in August for entering students. Um, and I, I noticed on these trips that good things happen to people there. And so when I finished Wheaton and went on to grad school at Washington State, I, I became interested in Shakespeare. I noticed that Shakespeare used a forest setting in about a third of his plays and important things happened to people in this forest setting. It was a site of exposure of character. You couldn't hide. You had to be who you really were. And you became aware of who you re really were, and other people did too. And if you didn't like who you were, it could become a place where good change could take place for Shakespeare's characters. Uh, if, if the play is a tragedy, <laughs> it's too late to change. At least the wilderness is a place of vision and perspective. Uh, I mostly wrote uh, my dissertation about Shakespeare's comedy As You Like It, which is set in the Forest of Arden. And uh, that's where uh, the Duke, sort of a Robin Hood figure in exile, comforting his men in the forest, says, uh, and this our life, exempt from public haunt that is away from the court, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones and good and everything. And uh, I thought, yeah, I think that's probably true. 
in some way. Now, so th those are some of the experiences that got me interested in wilderness and just made me think it, it's a place worth being, it's a place worth going, it's a place worth protecting. I couldn't have given you a very good rationale. As for so many things in our lives, uh, we're attracted to something and then we create a rationale for it after the fact. I was a biblical studies major at Wheaton College. Uh, and um, I know that uh, Professor Richter will be speaking in this series next month uh, about a biblical perspective on uh, environmentalism, is that right? And um, so she can correct some of my impressions, but I'll give you um, some of the thoughts and observations that I've accumulated for myself. And these are on your handout. Is there anyone else that needs a handout? Kenny has them. And I, I, won't, I, I won't get bogged down in any of these texts. You can come back to them, and I'm just giving you snippets of them. But sometimes I wonder um, if, if the Bible is primarily for us, uh, creation has its own story. Uh, creation story is connected to our story. There are hints of creation story in the Bible, but it might not be the whole story. Um, one of my favorite books growing up was A Horse and His Boy, one of the Narnia Chronicles, and there's a point late in the story where the action really gets heated up and one character finds Aslan and says, uh, but, but what happened to this other person? And Aslan says, I only tell each person his or her own story. And, and maybe, maybe that's what God's doing with us in the Bible. So there's, there's a little bit of sort of extension and speculation going on as I try to think about the nature of uh, the created world in scripture. So first of all, of course, in the first creation narrative, uh, four times it's repeated in the successive days of creation, uh, and it was good. This is what God pronounces. Uh, this is even before human beings appear on the scene. God is calling creation good. I don't know if it's taking too big of a leap to say that something about uh, creation is good, even apart from its appeal to or use to human beings. Maybe we can do that kind of thinking. Uh, of course, uh, when human beings are created, God saw everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. Okay? So, we are an important part of creation at once. Uh, at, at, at once? I, I don't even know what I meant to say there. Okay. Uh, but the question is, good for what? Okay. And that's, I'm going to try to organize the rest of my biblical observations around that question. Good for what? Um, when we get to the second creation narrative, the one that includes the Garden of Eden, it says, Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. I love this text. Okay? It suggests that creation has aesthetic value and it has utilitarian value. As John Muir said when he was trying to defend uh, Hetch Hetchy, that uh, Twin Valley to Yosemite Valley on the Tuolumne River uh, 100 years ago or so. He said, everybody needs beauty as well as bread. And I think that's rooted in this text. Uh, so, it's, it's, it's good in terms of aesthetic value. It's good in terms of its physical use to us, the creation. Um, and of course, God is the sustainer of creation, not just of us, but of the rest of creation. And Psalm 104 is a great one for that. You make springs gush forth in the valleys, they flow between the hills, giving drink to every wild animal. The wild asses quench their thirst. The wild asses, okay. Also the marmots, if I read this text correctly. Uh, so, what is the human relationship to creation? Of course, 
There's this crux verse, Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them, the people, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Um, well, some people have said this is the only commandment in the Bible that human beings have faithfully fulfilled is to be fruitful and multiply. We have indeed. We have filled the earth. Uh, so, you're probably aware of a classic article written by a historian in, uh, published in 1967, Lynn White, Jr., The Historical Roots of Our Current Ecological Crisis. And he blames it on the Judeo-Christian tradition and mostly on this verse. This is, he says, uh, we, we uh, are imbued with a, a dominion, uh, subdue and have dominion approach to the earth, and um, which has given rise to an anthropocentric, anthropocentrism, a, a view that human beings are what most matter on this planet, which has given rise to a lot of uh, misuse of the earth. Um, but what I want to say is, I think that verse in the first creation narrative is a bit in tension with the next verse from the second creation narrative. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. So you have subdue and have dominion over here, and you have till and keep over here. It's a really interesting, interesting tension. I'd also like in this section to introduce this familiar verse from the Psalms, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Um, and one response to Lynn White's charge that uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition is, is uh, anthropocentric is to, to say, no, maybe our tradition is primarily theocentric, okay? And um, I think Wendell Berry has uh, worked this area pretty well, his landmark essay, The Gift of Good Land. Uh, so we're, we're tenants. Uh, God is the landlord, and we have a responsibility. Um, just quickly, um, so, so it's, it's good because it belongs to God. It's, witness, it's good because it gives witness to God. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Uh, it, it participates in its own worship of God, at least in some of these anthropomorphic verses, primarily in the Psalms. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord. Um, I was reading through the Apocrypha, which I'd really never read through before until about 10 years ago, and I came across a passage in one of the wisdom books, the Wisdom of Solomon, that I think is the basis, really, for Paul's passage in Romans 1. So this excerpt, and it, it, it's a longer, beautiful passage. If through delight and the beauty of these things people assume them to be gods, let them know how much better than these is their Lord for the author of beauty created them. And if people were amazed at their power and working, let them perceive from them how much more powerful is the one who formed them. For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. I think Paul had this passage in mind when he wrote his letter to the Romans and said, ever since the creation of the world is eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. Uh, so creation is good because it testifies to the Lord and participates in worship of the Lord. Uh, finally, this little section I've labeled the curse and redemption of creation. The creation seems to be uh, intertwined with human beings such that when human beings fall, creation falls.
falls as well in some way. And to the man he said, cursed is the ground because of you. So, hmm, what does this mean? I don't know. I mean, there's one way of glossing the fall, of course, is that Adam and Eve took more than they needed from the garden. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of fall we keep replicating. And yet, if creation is cursed or participates in the curse, there are a number of passages in the Old and New Testament that suggest that nature shares in redemption. I won't read the entire passage. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, etc., etc. The child at the hole of the adder. Okay, this is Isaiah's vision of shalom, of this, uh, these broken relationships between human beings and the rest of creation restored in some fundamental and amazing way. Uh, I probably need Professor Richter to either affirm or correct me on the next one, but I'm told that when you get to John 3.16, you know, maybe our favorite verse, uh, those of us who are evangelicals, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And I'm told that uh, there's several, several words for the word world that John could have used, but he chose the word cosmos, which is the whole shebang, okay? What does that mean? What does that mean that Jesus died for the whole world? What could that possibly mean? Um, and this Romans 8 passage about creation waiting with eager longing, subjected to futility, but subjected in hope, uh, groaning in labor pains until now. Uh, a deeply mysterious, highly evocative passage and then the Colossians passage, from which we take our college motto, okay, about Christ being preeminent. Pay attention to the term all things through this passage. In him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. For through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in the cross, in, or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. It's my goodness, you know, all things clearly refers to all of creation as somehow participating in redemption. Um, and we get this language of a new heaven and a new earth. So, okay, thanks for being so patient, uh, my taking you through swiftly a number of biblical passages. How am I possibly going to get to my theme here of the wild? And it's, it, does it possibly have any importance in the midst of this biblical narrative? I, I want to I want to concede at the outset that I think the garden is the biblical ideal, okay? That garden below the track that Kenny takes so good care of, that, that's the ideal, is human beings working fruitfully uh, with nature, hand in hand. In hand. Um, but I come back to this notion of the curse. The problem is, we're fallen gardeners, okay? The garden is the ideal, okay? But we are fallen gardeners. Well, so what? Here's where I go out on a limb. Um, I think of the Sabbath as one day in the week where we put a limitation on our work that we do. Uh, what if we what if we thought of wilderness as a kind of Sabbath? And, and we could create an analogy like this. As the Sabbath is to time, wilderness is to space. Do, do you follow me? As Sabbath is to uh, time, wilderness is to space. So just as we limit our work in time on the Sabbath, we limit our work in space by agreeing there's some land, we'll leave it alone. But because even with our best intentions, we might kind of screw it up. 
I mean, think of all the uh, legacy of uh, wildlife mismanagement in different parks at Yellowstone or uh, it, it's just crazy. You know, you go after one species and then another goes crazy and then something gets introduced and it, it, everything, you know, and we're constantly trying to get things back in balance and we, we don't, ev even with our best intentions. Um, it makes me think of a poem by uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, the 19th century Jesuit poet. Uh, he wrote a poem called Binzy Poplars and I think Binzy is part of Oxford or outside of Oxford in England. And it's, there's an aspen grove that he really liked that got all cut down all at once. Um, I'll just read you a little part of the poem. Oh, if we but knew what we do when we delve or hew, that is when we dig or cut, hack and rack the growing green, since country is so tender to touch, her being so slender that like this sleek and seeing ball, the eyeball, but a prick will make no eye at all. Where we, even when we mean to mend her, we end her when we hew or dull. Even when we mean to mend her, we end her. Okay, and a creation being something as fragile as an eyeball. It just takes one little prick and we've done irreparable damage from time to time. So, that's my biblical rationale. I'd be really interested to hear in a few minutes what you think of it. Uh, if you want to modify it or extend it or refute it. Uh, but the last part of this presentation I want to call responding to the wild. So if wilderness is experientially valuable to us and we can find a way to see that it's perhaps biblically valuable as well, what's our, what's our response? Um, I, I think maybe First of all, just spending a little time there. Uh, John Muir uh, says, only by going alone in silence without baggage can one truly get into the heart of the wilderness. All other travel is mere dust and hotels and baggage and chatter. I, I like that last sentence. We, should, we could make that the motto for our off-campus programs. You know. <laughs> there's, there's just something about being alone in silence. Uh, I, my first year here, 30 years ago, I was so curious what these hills were about and what was behind these hills. And um, my, my dear wife let me go for eight days and I hiked about 80 miles. I saw only eight people in eight days, right, you know, in the San Rafael wilderness, uh, which just celebrated its 50th anniversary, although, of course, it's been there longer than that. Uh, so you can respond to the wild just by taking time to be there. Uh, I, th I think prayer for and in the wild seems to be important. Uh, Jesus, Jesus sets that example, doesn't he? He's always drawing away to a lonely place, sometimes on the mountain. And I sometimes wonder how important that setting was, maybe more important than we expect. Um, I think responding to the wild means uh, trying to live a minimum impact lifestyle. We talk about minimum impact, leave no trace when we're on a wilderness trip, but we can do that here at home and on campus. Uh, we had a wonderful presentation on recycling here um, a month or so ago. Uh, but, you know, just a lot of choices. We, how many cars do you need? Um, how many children do you need? How many houses do you need? How often do you need to hop on a jet? Uh, I've been rediscovering the wonders of the Westmont shuttle lately and the students are always surprised to see me but I'm glad to see them and 
I feel oh so self-righteous riding down the hill in the shuttle. <laughs> um, but, you know, even if you're the ultimate minimum impact person and, you know, all you need in life is a pair of Birkenstocks and a, a match, um, it, it really takes group effort to uh, make things happen to, to preserve wild places and there's a whole history of political conflict in our country. The uh, Wilderness Act of Congress, 1964, sets aside certain areas. Uh, so no roads, uh, no mechanized equipment, uh, uh, no logging, uh, no mi well, a little bit of mining. There's an exception there. Uh, so there have been a tapestry of land use battles and uh, consciously or unconsciously I have joined some of these. Uh, <laughs> I think my first was as a junior in high school and uh, one of our senators in the state of Oregon was coming to speak at our high school. I had been asked to introduce him. It was Bob Packwood and uh, I drew up this little petition that we should minimize horse travel in the Three Sisters Wilderness because I didn't like the way they were chewing up the trails. And he looked at it and he laughed, <laughs> kind of tossed it aside. But I, I was trying to wrap my mind around it. Um, working in um, Sierra Tracks, I remember learning about Mono Lake on the east side of Yosemite and the water going down because the water was all going to Los Angeles from the east side streams. And, we wrote letters and part of an effort that turned that around and the water came up and it's coming back up and it's being restored. I was in on the tail end of the Mineral King controversy um, and that's an area now, the southern part of Sequoia National Park, a beautiful little Shangri-La sort of valley. It was a mining area in the late 19th century. Uh, Walt Disney wanted to make it into a world-class destination ski resort. Uh, the Sierra Club opposed him. Uh, the battle went on for something like 15 years. But I remember visiting Mineral King before that battle was over and um, writing my letter to be part of that. And now that's where our uh, RAs go on their wilderness trip each August. It's in Mineral King. And it's, uh, I'm glad that area was saved. It became part of the park. Uh, I remember spending a day in college uh, filling out uh, a Yosemite master plan. <laughs> a se one seventh of Yosemite Valley was under pavement at that time, uh, under pavement or under structure. And the new superintendent of the park wanted public input to a new way of organizing the valley. And I remember taking a whole day out of my studies and conscientiously filling out that plan, and I was glad I did. Uh, in the early days of the Reagan administration, um, there was a new radical environmental group in the country called Earth First, and they believed in direct action. And uh, being uh, young and uh, full of vigor, uh, my, my brother and I joined in some blockades of some logging roads that were being built. Uh, our contention was they were being built illegally right on the boundary of the Calmeopsis Wilderness in Southern Oregon to prevent more wilderness to be added to it. Uh, and the road was stopped finally uh, by a judge and, and said to be illegal. And so this, this uh, I don't know, it made me nervous a little bit. I remember being part of the blockade and the guy with the bulldozer stops and he talks to us and I thought, you know, I really like that guy in the bulldozer. I, and some of these people I'm blockading with seem pretty weird to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's complication in these things. Um, when I was a graduate student at Washington State, I spent two years as chair of the wilderness group of the Sierra Club in Spokane. And we were working on a statewide wilderness bill. We added a million acres to protected wilderness in the state. 
Our area was the very northeast corner of the state of Washington, a set of ridges called the Salmo Priest Wilderness. Uh, and its selling point was it had the last herd of caribou in the 48 states, mm -hmm. mountain caribou. And uh, so the Sierra Club made me a caribou suit with antlers and I ran an eight mile road race and all the rest. Uh, so the list goes on. The Hoover Wilderness, where we've gone on the inoculum, uh, was recently enlarged. Uh, I asked our former president, Stan Gady, to write a letter as, you know, Westmont College as a stakeholder, and he did. Well, actually, I wrote the letter, he signed it, but <laughs> um, that was very gratifying. We got an increase there. Uh, and I have to, I have to say, uh, my older brother, Dave, whom I mentioned, has spent really most of his life uh, on an area in southern Oregon that's now protected as a national monument, the Cascade Siskiyou National Monument. Um, not for its scenic value particularly, although I think it is pretty, but for its exceptional biodiversity. Uh, you, you may have read in the news how since uh, uh, Donald Trump has become president. Uh, some of these national monuments are in the crosshairs. A couple in Utah have been reduced. Uh, it's not clear whether uh, the president has the legal right to reduce these areas, but he's trying. And this one in Oregon is probably the next on the hit list. Mm -hmm. So I've been watching that from a distance. So I would say if this interests you, um, choose something, be local. You can't be involved in every issue in the world. Uh, there, there are groups I belong to, the Sierra Club, the Wilderness Society, the Yosemite Conservancy, the Sequoia Natural History Association. Uh, locally, the Los Padres Forest Watch, really interesting group. It's kind of a citizen watchdog group on what happens in Los Padres National Forest right behind our town. I'll have to admit, though, that I found I'm not really a creature of politics, uh, unlike, unlike my brother. You know, he, he lives for that cut and thrust and uh, the strategizing. And, uh, you know, when I've been really quite involved in wilderness politics, I have this feeling that it's not really me. It's good work, but it's probably not me. So that I, I think that the way I found to be involved in wilderness is actually kind of celebrating it. It's mostly what I write about. And I think I have a kind of symbiotic relationship with my brother. He's a full-time activist. I, I write about wilderness. Uh, it uh, is inspiring to him, if no one else, uh, what I write. I remember um, the Northwest writer David James Duncan was visiting Westmont 15 years ago. Uh, was in Oregon, now in Montana. He's an exceptional fiction writer, uh, The River Y, The Brothers K. Uh, and he's a, he's a fisherman. He's particularly involved with saving rivers. So you might remember a book and a film called A River Runs Through It by Norman McLean. I think that's the Blackfoot River in Montana. It was threatened by a cyanide gold mine. And uh, Duncan quit his writing for a year, and he led the charge to save the river, and he did. But when he was here, he complained to me. He says, man, I just want to write, you know. But I feel so torn. I have this side that wants to write. I've got this <coughs> activist side. What do I do? And I said, David, you need a brother. <laughs> 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 so relieve your guilt. So. Um, my last sabbatical, I got to be an artist in residence in North Cascades National Park. They gave me a cabin. My whole job for four weeks in the fall, six weeks into spring was to hike around and write poems. I like to say, your tax dollars at work. <laughs> uh, and so I think I'll just end with a, maybe a poem or two from the collection that came out of it. Deer at Twilight, poems from the North Cascades. Uh, yeah, I'll just read two poems, and that'll be it, and then, and then I'll be interested in your responses. Here's the title poem, uh, Dear at Twilight. Yesterday evening, from my campsite in the forest on the edge of the reservoir, 
I saw a deer walk cautiously to the end of a long sandy point. So far I was. At first I thought it a coyote or someone's dog or who knows, maybe a wolf. But it was in fact a single deer, diminished by distance, a silhouette against the sheen. I could tell by the way it held its head, innocently high and alert, and the way it bent its neck to drink. As twilight faded, I could not say if it were standing on sand or water. It was so quiet, the snowy peaks beyond were bathed in such pure glow, that had the deer walked all the way across the lake, delicately printing the surface with each fine hoof, I would have bowed down and believed. And the last poem I want to read you is uh, appropriately titled Sustainability. Uh, it has larch trees in it. Do you know what larch trees look like? We don't have them in California. They're, they look like conifers, like fir trees, but they're actually deciduous. So the needles turn gold and, in the fall and they drop. And they're brilliant gold color. So they're, they're a mark of our northern forests. Uh, so I started this talk with a bad dream, and this poem contains a good dream. And maybe that's what art is about, is making good dreams, sustainability. A few weeks after my mother died, I dreamed that she was waiting for me in a ravine of spring green larches. There was no worry in her eyes. And she sat there with her knees drawn up, content to be in the filtered sunlight. Funny, because she never lived among larch trees. My mom grew up on an orange grove and raised us in the Douglas fir. I do not live among them either, apart from my rare visits to the North Cascades. But when I'm here, as now I am, sitting barefoot on cutthroat paths among amber larches, bathing every bowl and basin, I have a sense that she's okay and that I am too, born to witness what I can within this green and golden world, which still persists with or without us, but mostly with us, I've come to believe. Things and people pass away, but that's when they become themselves. There is a new heaven, a new earth around and about us, and not much different from the better parts of the old. We don't live there very often, but when we do, eternity ignites in a moment, light in the larches that shines and shines. All right. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>